Okay, so let's call the meeting to order at 634. Um, we want to look at the agenda. Are there any corrections or additions before we move on? This is the time to do that. Okay, hearing no, we will um, public comments. Anybody here? Nope. Nope. Okay, um, the GMFF 2024, who's going to take the lead on that? So Paibon is here, and um, I think she has a slide deck. I printed it out, but I think that Paibon's going to share it. But oh, if you right. wanted a paper form, I printed one out because it was pretty color heavy. But um, um, yeah, if I can share my screen, I will do that. Um, thank you. Uh, Oh, darn it. Um, just a minute. Zoom does this thing where it's making me open my settings. And? Well, she's trying to put up her PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello. Spoilers in there, though. Yeah. Spoilers. Apologies about that, friends. I will get to try again. Um, thank you for bearing with me for a minute here. Um, I am going to share my screen for a second. And I am going to, I know I only have 15 minutes uh, on your agenda, so I really appreciate the time. Um, oh, come on, are you kidding me? Okay, hang on just a second. Um, Jen, I'm really glad you pointed that out, printed that out because. I was going to say, I have it here too, if it. If you want me to just go ahead and try sharing it from our end. Oh, maybe that's the better thing. Um, and um, I'll just walk through it. Okay. Be good. Thank, you. Thank you for joining us, by the way. Yes. You're welcome. Yep. So yep. for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paiban Lukumhan. I live in Barrie. I work in Montpelier as festival director for last year's festival. I am former downtown director from Montpelier Alive, co-founder of Poem City. I am the zone agent field staff for the Vermont Creative Network. And um, I joined um, uh, the advisory committee for the Green Mountain Film Festival um, so that I could um, help get this off the ground. I know that the Green Mountain Film Festival is super important to the cultural offerings of downtown Montpelier. And that was what was really important for me was to help um, continue the um, the good work that has happened for the over 20 years. So the Green Mountain Film Festival was established in 1997 with a bunch of volunteers. And um, so Paivon, are you, did I share it accurately? Um, I just see your drive thing. It's the GMFF 2024 report. Uh, so I'm just trying to get to the right one. Okay. I, I got, oh, we just right. had it, but it keeps coming back to your drive menu. Where is it then? Okay. Oh, 
Yeah. What was worse to you trying to lie? Exactly. That and the, yeah. and the, the handheld microphone. Never. Okay. So if you want to scroll up to the screen before that. Okay. Please. One second. Let me just mirror it because I think that's partially uh, all that was. Two. I can't see exactly what was happening. So. Okay. So the slide before this one, it's just a little quote from John Kalaki, who has been a uh, filmmaker for 18 years. And he felt that the Green Mountain Film Festival was important enough for him to actually put a review on Film Freeway, which is where a lot of festivals get their uh, submissions. Great curation, wonderful gathering for filmmakers and engaged post screenings conversation grateful to be a part of it. That was very meaningful for us. So the next slide, um, just to remind you about what happened in case you weren't here, um, the Green Mountain Film Festival has been a part of uh, Focus on Film, which was the organization that housed it. Um, in 2019 was their last festival. Uh, 2020 shut down because of COVID. They took all this time to figure out what, what is the next thing. Um, 20, summer 2022 was when the conversations really took in earnest with Orca Media and when the program got transferred to Orca Media. We ended up deciding to make it an independent project just to kind of keep it independent because that has always been the ethos of the Green Mountain Film Festival with Orca Media as the fiscal sponsor. So in 2022 is when it actually officially transferred. Uh, Christopher Wiersma, um, who was co-director at the time with ORCA, um, took it upon himself to assemble the advisory committee. And in February 2023 is when the advisory committee finally really came together to have this deep conversation about what are we going to do? What is this festival about? And by the fall of that year is when we staffed up. Our core group had been and continues to be festival programmer, festival director, sponsorship manager, and advisory board chair. Um, so that's when we started working. Planning happened between October and March. We launched the festival in March. Uh, 14 to 17 is a four-day festival, which has happened in the past, so we know that that worked. And then over the summer, as we have all gone and done other things, uh, we have checked in with each other to see what worked and what hasn't worked. Um, so that's basically the timeline. It, it took place over a couple of years, but we consider that our year one project. So the next slide is our, uh, shows us our year one focus. And so this will be, I'll show you um, what we tried to do. I'll show you what uh, we've learned from it. And then I'll show you some of the data that kind of supports all of that. So we're focusing on operations, fundraising and production. So operations, because we got a bunch of spreadsheets, but we didn't actually have a fully fledged thing that we could absorb. So we basically had to run this thing from scratch and we leaned on all of our knowledge about how to run things digitally because we felt like that was the new age now. And the um, budget that we received has increased mostly because of inflation uh, due to pandemic year inflation. And then also because we felt like we wanted everybody to get fair compensation. And then the production is a mix of like, this was the year that Montpelier got flooded. And we really wanted the community to feel like this was their event. And so all of the things that we tried to do were um, towards that goal. Um, so uh, the next slide will go into operations. And then in the following slides, we'll go into each one of those other things. So for our operations, we really leaned into digital. And um, that meant uh, using the ticketing service that Savoy used because we assumed that they were gonna be our primary location. Um, and we used a bunch of open source software and integratable software. Uh, Ghost, Give Butter, Zapier, all that stuff. You don't need to know this. The important thing to know is that we did have a dedicated person to help us with the support, which was like super important. So we didn't, each of us need to know all of the inner workings of the software. We just need to know that it all worked together. 
Um, the digital strategy was where I think we made up for a lot of lost time because we needed to tell people that we were back and how to be uh, a part of what we we're doing. So with the ghost website, we were able to gain a lot of new followers and send them newsletters directly to their email box. Uh, because we're a nonprofit, because Orca is a nonprofit, we were able to tap into the Google Ads Manager grant program, which gave us ads for free. Um, and we were able to um, implement a lot of uh, organic search um, uh, items to our website to get us to get people to know about us. And we used social media, which we already had, which we um, had gotten from uh, folks that we um, gained this program from. And then we really tried to push pre-buys. Um, the one thing that was another thing that was really different from what has happened in the past, because in the past, they've had one paid staff person, which was the executive director. They managed everything with a volunteer base. And so what we did was we defined roles that we needed to have happen. And we had folk, people focus on those roles, which really helped a lot because we all have our specialties. And so we're clear on the outcomes that we need to do. We have our own lanes that we stay in. We know where this decision-making happens. And then when we get together, we know what we're putting out on what we expect from each other. And then the other thing that was also really important was we felt like um, we needed to be able to be the front-facing organization. Um, so we needed to own our customer service experience. Um, because that's going to make or break us because it's a small community. Um, so we didn't want to trust the Savoy or the Capitol Theater to be our go-betweens because all the information they would have would come from us anyway. So um, if we just we just were the front line for all of that. Um, so that was important to us. So, and um, since you have these um, slides, um, I'm happy to answer questions uh, later on. There's a lot of detail in here. So for fundraising slide, um, the important thing to know is that we were as diversified as we could figure out to be. Donations, ticket sales, sponsorships, and miscellany, which was basically the, the fees of the merch. In the past, um, donations and ticket sales were pretty much the primary um, funding sources. Uh, we were able to get one of our longtime sponsors to give us a $5,000 match. I have to say we did not meet that, meet that match. Um, it was really hard once the flood hit to do any fundraising. Uh, we thought we might do fundraising with the opening night. That didn't happen. And obviously our community had a lot going on. So uh, same thing with sponsorships. Sponsorships was something that we knew that the previous group really didn't lean on very much, but we had a dedicated sponsorships manager who that was just their job. And so um, we had a target goal, $75,000. We didn't meet that either, but we got enough. Um, and now in this digital day and age, we were really able to um, execute on a lot of the promises that we had for them uh, without it being super intensive. And then the other revenue sources were ticket sales and merch. So ticket sales, we really tried to push advanced ticket sales so that we had money on hand that we needed to spend. And merch really ended up being, I don't know, in-person stuff. It didn't end up being very much. So for um, I have captions on each of these that tells you what the pictures are. So I just wanted to give you like a taste of what happened if you didn't show up. So. This one is like, we had after parties, late night, people wanted late night stuff. So this is an example of one of the late night things that happened. So the next slide is for production. We worked asynchronously, which is kind of what happens now these days, which is great because Sam was also in Japan some of the time. She was in New York City some of the time. Teresa was in New York. I was all over the place. So it was really, really great to be able to work together with all of these different um, technologies that we have. Um, the major thing was we needed to get the word out about what we were doing um, because it had been about five years um, and everybody kind of forgot about the film festival. So marketing promotions was a really big heavy lift, but we knew that that had to happen. 
Um, we grew our email list. We leaned on social media. We leaned on digital ads. And um, because of a lot of connections that I have already, I was able to get a lot of um, interviews with the newspaper, radio, and TV. So that really helped us a lot. And we did see that um, sometimes when an article posted, we would see a little bump in sales. So that was really helpful. Film selection, the crew was great. They loved it. We had a minimum set of um, characteristics that we needed. One was that they needed to have not premiered in Vermont before because we needed it to be special. And also we, uh, it's not in here, but we wanted to have um, movies that weren't more than two years old um, because we wanted people to come to movies that they hadn't seen before. Um, so and overall, we had over three dozen movies, including shorts, including Vermont made movies, which was really great. And we also had some complimentary program, which was something that they had done in the past that uh, we had been told was um, something that was helpful. Um, event logistics, I'm a professional event producer. I've done it a lot in my work with Montpelier Live and a bunch of other places. So I think we had pretty smooth one of the things that we did, which I would definitely recommend to many people if you're having a multi-day festival is to have one person in charge of the day. And it wasn't always me, even though I was festival director. So I was in charge of like Saturday. I think that was my day. Um, but we spread it out amongst everybody um, so that people could get rest, which was like super important. We had a bunch of last minute changes. We had some people got sick. We had some venues we couldn't use, all that kind of stuff um, that happened. So um, some unforeseen, unforeseen things that we couldn't, that we had to figure out um, on the spot, like security for, because like at one point I had like $500 and $1 bills in my bag. And I like had to figure out how to like deal with that because we have people from out of town, we don't know. What the security measures are. Uh, we did get volunteers and we understood that volunteers was like the base of the workforce. Excuse me. In previous times, but honestly, we didn't get as many volunteers as I thought we would get for an organization that really had dedicated uh, following. Um, so that was a disappointment, but also I recognize there's less people around and People are strapped for time too. So I get that. One of the things that I was kind of um, couldn't figure out is that people wanted to make sure that they had a ticket to a movie in exchange for their volunteer time, which kind of goes against like my own understanding of volunteering, but that's just something that can work out. <laughs> okay. Um, so next slide is kind of, is just kind of top line, what we learned about these uh, focus areas. One, we need to cross train for everything. And I know this because I've worked in nonprofits for a long time, uh, which is one of the reasons why last year I was festival director and Christopher was uh, advisory board chair. And this year we're gonna switch around. He's gonna be festival director and I'm gonna be advisory board chair so that we have plentiful training and experience so that we can um, fill in where we need to. This happened also during production when some folks had to chip in to do audiovisual or to do projection. We just need to do a lot of cross training. Um, fundraising, um, diversified income, which you'll see later in my graphs, um, is super important for this. Like. It seems like really obvious that we just need to sell a lot of tickets, but it, that's actually not necessarily the truth. And for production, because we are a new team um, and we're an agile team, what we wanted to do was test all of our assumptions. And so this first year, we did a lot of testing to see whether people will choose to do virtual, choose to buy their tickets online, choose to come at last minute, all of those things. Um, but it was also really good to have a festival hub, which we know from past experience was something that, that folks did for a ticket um, box office. We didn't necessarily need to do that because we did a lot of advanced ticket sales, but it was still a nice like community thing to do. So those that's the top line. 
And then the next slide, I think, just introduces, we'll, we'll go deeper into ticket sales because this is, I think, what people want to know. So, <laughs> um, we did, we tried to sell a lot of tickets. So we had over 3,000 tickets. We had four day festival with three screens on two of the major days and two screens on some of the lesser days. So uh, we tried to have free festival offerings like holiday packs, early bird. We did general admission two weeks before the festival started. And then with the general admission sales, we tried not to make it complicated. So we did like regular price, which was $12. And we did senior and students, which was $10. And then we even had like free events as well, especially for ones where we knew that we had to like cap the attendance for. And then we did a bunch of promotions, uh, ticket packs. We even had sponsored tickets. So we had um, companies that like, they wanted to sponsor, but they didn't have uh, enough in their budget to meet the minimum sponsorship. So they basically subsidized a bunch of tickets. And so we could offer some free tickets to folks. And then we had a bunch of comps for our sponsors, for people who volunteered, for our screening committee, for our staff, for like all these different people to just get seats in because the worst thing <laughs> is to not have people watch these movies. Um, so one of the things that we found out is that people are okay buying tickets online now. I think that this whole COVID thing, doing streaming, all this stuff really helped us to be able to get 90% of our uh, sales were online. Oh, that's great. Even the same day in person. <clears throat> so if people came to us at Rabble Rouser <clears throat> to buy a ticket, we would just do the same thing that they would do at home. We're just like, okay, we'll pick this movie for you, blah, blah, blah. Just scan your... Um, your card here. Um, and so of the physical tickets that we had to issue, <laughs> excuse me, I'm talking so much. Um, it was only like two dozen physical tickets that we hand wrote, uh, which was great. And those were for people who did not want to give us their emails so they wouldn't get a receipt. Uh, folks who paid in cash, who didn't want to give us an email. Um, folks who just needed the physical because that's really their thing. So um, so that was uh, uh, definitely a um, deviation from what folks had told us in the past. So next one is, oh, so here we're talking about some of the assumptions that we had. Most of our people, they're going to be in Vermont. We got that. Uh, so a lot of this data comes from our ticketing platform, which is why we went digital and also why we owned the whole uh, customer service uh, process is so that we can have all of this data. I think in the past, folks were really relying on the theater venue to provide them with this information and it wasn't always complete or standardized data set. So um, we know now based on the ticket sales that we have, 85% were from Vermont. We had assumed that most of our viewers were going to be seniors, uh, retired people, <laughs> excuse me, folks who had the time. That was not the case. And we only, oh, everything is on the honor system. I don't card people to ask them how old they are or anything like that. So folks who, uh, bought at the senior student level was only 40%. Um, so most of the people bought at the general admission level, uh, which I think means that we're skewing younger, um, but not too young. So we're within that disposable income bracket. And the other thing that we were told is like, they're not gonna buy online, but we made people buy online and they did. And so that helped us a lot because we got a lot of those funds before we actually had the festival so we could spend it. And also we know that we are in a technologically savvy environment at this point. Um, so 91% um, <clears throat> people bought online. Love it. Next one. Um, so looking at the top sales day, 
should have figured this out, but it took me until I figured out, I looked at the data to figure this out. March 1 is when we launched general admission. So we did all of that pre-sales beforehand, the holiday packs, the early bird stuff. March 1, when we let everybody buy tickets was when we had the most sales. It was over $4,000 that one day. And that's a combination of ticket packs, single tickets, whatever. By that time, we had already had the program available uh, for two weeks. So people could know which movies it could go to or not. Um, so you'll see advanced tickets, obviously, past packs. And then 14, 15, 16, and 17 were the days of the festival. So you can kind of see the traffic there. Obviously, less advanced tickets, more same day tickets. Some past packs happened because folks came in groups and they wanted the discount rate for their group. So um, next slide talks about um, our digital strategy for discoverability um, because we were online and we wanted to make sure people knew that this festival was happening so that we could sell as many tickets as possible. Um, so the first graph is number of new users by device. This is all from uh, the Google Analytics on our website. So uh, previously I said we had uh, maximized our website for SEO. This is the reason why we did it, so that we could get all of these analytics. So pretty evenly split between people who use desktop or mobile device. Doesn't matter if you're on the computer or on your phone, uh, you can find us. Second graph, new users by source. This is all organic except for referred and <clears throat> paid. So the SEO work we did is that pink bar. People were able to type into their browser, be like, bring your own film festival, and it got us there. So we got uh, most of our hits for new users was from search. Referral is actually something that we did when we did like ads on VT Digger, for example, we would have a specific link that would tell us it was coming from this site or from the bridge or we posted something on Facebook from Porch Forum so that we know that these specific things are bringing people to our website. <clears throat> Paid is the Google Ads Manager. So I said before we had this free program, Google Ads Manager, they give it to all the nonprofits in the whole world, basically. And uh, we did both AdWords and image ads. Um, and then social is, we were on Facebook and Instagram. So if you're on Facebook, you see a post that we have and you click through it, uh, that's contributing to that blue bar. And then the last graph is engagement. And this is where we're really accounts. So this is, gives us the ROI on that. Does it even matter what we're doing? Um, and so this is percentage of people who click through. So the pink percentage, people who click through almost 50. If you're typing Green Mountain Film Festival, you're standing there, you get through our website, you got it. Um, so referrals. Definitely worked. Uh, we got a lot of referrals from BT Digger. We got referrals from the bridge, other specific placements that uh, we really tried to get specific readership and paid actually like blew us away because this is the Google ads. We didn't have to pay for anything. We just set it and forget it. This shows up on anything. If you're on the New York Times, if you're on Fox News, if you're on Spotify, wherever they get these ads um, and they have extra space, these are where the paid ads work. <clears throat> Social, again, like Facebook and Instagram, these are the percentage of people who stay on our website once they click through. So average engagement for um, for this type of click through is like a minute. People like will spend a minute on your page, to figure out what they need to do. Our users are spending three to five minutes. And so that means that we are actually have a lot of content that they're engaging with and they actually where we want to know. It. So I think that we did really good with our digital strategy. <clears throat> okay, next slide. And this again is digital strategy. So Google calls them users. So I just call them users. But what we want to know is, are we reaching people by location? Because this is actually a fiscal event. So yellow capital region, green is otherwise in Vermont, and pink is regional metro area. So these are drive times. Montpelier, I mean, sorry, Montreal, Boston, New York City, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, anywhere within the New England area. 
<clears throat> this is all information from our Google Analytics. I did your best guess when I did all this, but uh, basically 50% within Vermont, uh, most of that throughout Vermont and some of it from the capital region, I would only suggest that people were able to find the information within our local area in Montpelier, Barrie, et cetera, big outside of the website. You know, people can stop by my office and talk to me and whatever. So, but 50% was from the regional metros area. And then the other bar graph is also engagement, like you saw in the previous <laughs> slide. So you can see like, Folks that are looking for us when they get to our website, are they staying and are they engaging with our content? So I feel like um, we were able to get people interested and they stayed and figured out <clears throat> what they needed to know here. So I only included these three regions because there's a lot of spam bots and stuff like that. You get like Ukraine, you get Hong Kong, whatever. Like none of that is factored in here only because we wanted to take a look at the valuable stuff for folks that, that we think are actually gonna translate into sales and actual attendance. So that's what this represents. <clears throat> Question. Mm -hmm. hey, would you mind going back just that one slide? I just keep thinking about this. Uh, are those three sections, are they by dates? Um, what are the, <clears throat> I'm just curious why the, at the end, because of the media that the blue is so, is so high and um, nothing in the first column. Oh, um, well, the first uh, the first graph is by device. So each of these graphs have different factors in them. So the only devices that really showed up in Google Analytics are the mobile phones, the desktop, and the tablets, because that's really the only way you can get to the website. Right. Um, that's why there's only three of them there. And so when you look at the last, the, the other two graphs, search, referral, paid, and social, those um are different um, ways that people got to the site once they got online. Right. So once you get online, you can either type in Green Mountain Film Festival, you can you know, see it on a newsletter, somebody else said, hey, check this out, or you see an ad, or you're on like Facebook or Instagram and you see one of our posts and you click on it. So that's what those two graphs represent, which is why they're four. Um, because they were, uh, they strategically all work together. Thank you very much. I couldn't figure that out. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, so next slide. <clears throat> um, budget. That's what everyone wants to know. I tailored this presentation to you all, not knowing exactly what you would want, but I thought maybe you'd want to know budget. Um, so basically, we did receive. <clears throat> a kind of basic what they were going to do in 2020, which they didn't end up doing because it got shut down. And then <clears throat> the, uh, the next uh, things here are going to be coming from the actuals. Um, so this is what um, Jim has translated to me from the um, QuickBooks. So basically just to kind of mirror the timeline as to um, how we organize the festival. These are the big things that happened. You know, we got $14,000 infusion from the uh, previous uh, organizers. We ran a donor campaign. We ended up getting sponsors. Tharefully, we got a present sponsor $20,000, which was Sarducci's, and we like put their name everywhere, which is great. But once we got them, we were able to get a lot of other ones. <clears throat> and then we had to start spending. So that blue dot is like, we had to start uh, putting all of our uh, deposits on everything. And we also started at the same time doing advanced ticket sales because we were spending all this money and we still needed more. Um, and then like wrapping it up at the end afterwards, there were still things to collect, still things to pay out on. So like that's kind of the ebb and flow of the um, <clears throat> expenses. So uh, next slide. Um, so the income categories, this is just pretty basic and then we'll have expense categories next, just so you have an understanding of like the revenue uh, matrix that we have donations accounted for 17% sponsorships counted for 53% ticket sales accounted for 28% and the seed funding cost uh, accounted for 17%. So <clears throat> it's really important for us to get the seed funding because 
before we could get all the other money, we still had to spend money. So we had still had to pay people to do the work. We still had to like make ads and all that stuff. Um, so this is just cash basis based on the transactions that we had. Um, doesn't include any of the like really small residual stuff and does not include in kind. We had a lot of in kind partnerships, both income and expense categories. Just so you know, like we really tried to not use cash as much as we could. Um, and so this, if you do rough math, it's about $80,000. Um, the budget that we uh, acquired from the previous organizing group was about $20,000. <laughs> so um, this was a huge increase. And part of this was because we put a major focus on sponsorships, which they had acknowledged in conversations with me that they hadn't done before. Um, and part of the reason you'll see in the next slide is because their expenses were different. So the expense categories, um, kind of all over the board. Personnel is the four core uh, roles that we had. Me as festival director, um, Christopher, who was giving us in kind, so it's not even put in here. Um, Sam, who was the festival programmer, Teresa, who is our sponsorship manager, uh, that was 33% of our personnel. So in the past, they've had one person doing all of this work. Um, but now that we have specialties, everyone can focus and do really specific, excellent work in their own uh, specialty. Uh, film acquisition, $12,000. That was the budget that they had given us, stuck to it, um, and the same budget they had in 2020. Festival operations was quite a lot more because we added another theater. So we had the Savoy and then we also added the Capitol Theater and then we had um, a bunch of logistics. We hired projectionists, we um, ended up um, a lot of small things like added up to that uh, festival operations. So I tend to consider film acquisition as a subcategory of festival operations. So if you put those two together, it's about 40% of our entire expenses goes directly towards that four day festival. And then marketing promotions uh, was a quarter of our expenses. And that was website, that was posters, that was guidebook, that was that digital strategy that I just talked about. Um, because nobody knew about us for five years. And so we really, really need to put the effort into making sure people knew that we were here and that they could take part in the festival. Um, so that's that. So uh, I want, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. With, so because you're you're saying that there was more of a push for the marketing and promotions, mm -hmm. you foresee that in subsequent years since you have reestablished that, that maybe that would decrease? Um, not for 2025. We've already done a preliminary budget for it. And um, because some of that is because we have new creative direction all the time. Um, part of that is because technology and information sharing changes all the time. Um, I don't know that it's going to be any different, but I think 25% of our budget towards marketing and promotions is really a, a small amount compared to the fact that like we're being as efficient as we can and we're using a lot of free, um, free avenues. What I would love to do is to do a little bit more to get into the markets that we have just tipped our toe in but haven't really established. Um, so uh, Burlington, Chittenden County market, we have some people coming in there, but we have we tried to do some postering and our digital strategies, mm, okay, but we didn't do any really um, partnered marketing. So we didn't tap into a UVM network. We didn't do any of that sort of stuff. So there's a lot more that we can do. Even if we still remain within that 25%, we can shift how we focus so that we can gain traction over time. I I really don't think that's where we should shave any expenses. Oh, so, so so you would expect it to be fixed to roughly 25 probably in the future percent. I, I, I think so. Yeah. If we want to continue doing what we're doing. 
Um, so the next other important part is community engagement, because this festival does not happen without our community. Um, and unfortunately, we had this flood. We had to deal with that. Um, so basically, everything at the Capitol Theater is brand new, brand new seats. Uh, we brought them in partly because I go to the Capitol Theater all the time and um, just it seemed crazy not to have our other movie theater as part of it. But we were also trying to get as many nonprofits and other people who might be arts adjacent into um, this programming as possible to make it a really big community celebration. Uh, so the last two slides, I won't bore you with it too much, but I think it's really important to note um, how much the Green Mountain Film Festival uh, improves the creative sector locally. So we did business in the course of our operations with over 3,000 local organizations, businesses, nonprofits, um, other incorporated businesses. And we did contracts with 15 different uh, creatives, web design, creative design, folks who I can't even name them all right now. Um, but that was really important for us to keep the money circulating within our community. And then also the other thing that was really important for us was to make sure that the filmmakers got fair compensation. Fair is definable however we want it. For us, it was whatever we could afford. So basically we made sure even folks who, uh, who were submitting films that we wanted, who weren't asking for a fee, we made sure that we made the, gave them a fee. If people, um, in, in lieu for a fee, sometimes we gave them lodging or free meals or free tickets. Somehow we compensated them for their work because our festival doesn't happen without their contribution. And we felt that that was really, really super important. And we wanted to make sure that that was the baseline for film festivals going forward. So um, 41 filmmakers and distributors got paid uh, or compensated. And we feel really good about that. And then the other thing that was also really important to us is to recognize that there are a lot of different people in our community and that they all have different ways of interacting with film and cinema and that we wanted to bring them in as much as possible. So um, in being inclusive was definitely strategic on our part. Um, so targeting youth and students, targeting BIPOC people, seniors, targeting folks that are neurodivergent who may never see themselves in the theater. These were all really important things for us. And thankfully, we had partners who felt the same. So we were able to uh, get youth programming. We were able to partner with the schools, um, get some subsidized tickets. Um, we were able to get subsidized tickets for seniors, for BIPOC. We had films that uh, would be within their interests. We made physical accommodations. Um, neurodivergence, we did virtual tickets, which I never thought we would do, but uh, I didn't know. Also, because we had all been sequestered in our houses for like three years and streaming things, I honestly didn't know if people would come out to the theaters, but thankfully we did have sellouts, um, but still a uh, virtual option was something that we heard over and over again was something that our neurodivergent community needed. And so live streaming events and having pre-records that people could play at their own time was also important. So I just want to make sure that you guys know that we're trying to think of the overall broad community as well when we're thinking about film and presenting it to everyone. And that's it. I think I've used up all of my time. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to take questions. Very nice. I'm curious if, if there's any, uh, first of all, I'd just like to say it was, a, the festival was a, was a, a great fun and, and a good, and a great success. Everyone I talked to uh, absolutely had a blast. And I think another yeah. thing, in terms of your in-kind contributions, the uh, being being able to put people up at the um, definitely in, in the dorms, at, at, like had a totally different vibe for like down at the uh, crumb crumb factory, like yeah. like really really uh, people were like hanging out, having fun. It felt sort of like a collegey sort of vibe, I guess. With <laughs> I guess it feels. I'm curious if you had any like sort of big picture takeaways, things that you're going to, uh, that lessons learned. Yeah, 
So um, thanks for that. And um, there are a lot of things that I didn't cover in this slideshow and I wish that I could, but that would take your whole meeting. Um, so big thing, uh, the way I approach projects, this is me personally, is I don't wanna be stuck with a project forever. So what I'm trying to do is to create structures and uh, systems in place so that anyone who wants to be part of it, if wants to continue to be part of it can, and they have a way to do it that has been thoughtful. Um, so that's what we're continuing to try to do over time is to basically have a manual that we know is gonna change because technology changes, people's tastes change, whatever. Um, so that um, anyone can pick this up, even if the whole crew is gone tomorrow, we can give you a festival that you can do. You know, so that's the biggest goal of ours. All of this, it leads towards that. Um, the other takeaway is that we got a lot of information from previous uh, volunteers and organizers about what they thought the festival was. And we really tried to preserve a lot of that, but some of it just didn't pertain anymore. So as you could see, like um, they all told us that the physical guidebook was the thing. People were gonna need to have physical tickets and people were old and they wanted documentaries. And we can have a festival that doesn't, that can change with our community when our community changes. And so that's also something that I hope that people can take away too, is that just because it's been a certain way for 20 years, uh, doesn't mean that we, we can't learn again from, you know, the changes in our community. So that's the big thing, honestly, um, that I think is, um, kind of um, long-term lessons. How many people altogether do you think participated? Do you have a way of counting? Um, yes and no, because there are some things that we didn't do count on, um, but we had um, over 3,000 seats available for the film festival. So if we're talking about film proper, we sold about 75% of those tickets. Great. Um, yeah, which was amazing because I still go to the movies like every week and there's only like two people in those theaters uh, still. Um, so the, the theater industry is still struggling, but I think that this festival really helped a lot um, because the fair market value that we paid these festivals were based on seats. So basically um, the uh, Capitol Theater and the Savoy, we, structured the venue fee based on like, if they had a sold out show, what would they normally get? And that's what we paid them. Um, so we basically approached it as we're gonna sell out. Um, so, uh, so that's one way of measuring. And then, and then there's anecdotal. Okay. You know, Sarducci's, it was our presenting sponsor and they can tell us every night they, they had full tables mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff that like you can't really measure, but you can feel. I was I'm just sitting here thinking how we could help you with some of the shows we do, making small vignettes um, over time and releasing them mm -hmm. all the time so that um, people could be all psyched up the, uh, before March comes around. Oh, that would be lovely. Let's talk about that. Sure. That's right. Hopefully, David. Would you, uh... You, you've told us all this thing, the amazing things that had to happen to have this work out. I thought about trying to say how we did it in case there were other communities that have had programs and film festivals not happen and needed to find someone like a cable access community event and how many steps it would take to replicate this in other areas. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for that. And that was part of what I was trying to get to originally by having the structures in place. And um, eventually, I think we'd like to have a kind of a guidebook. It might be a little too specific for us. Um, uh, I was on a Zoom call earlier this week with a film festival that kind of shops their film festival around to different cities. So you can just buy their festival and they'll just come in and do it for you. Um, and that's a way to do it. 
Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do a film festival. Um, some film festivals really, it just depends on your niche and what you want to do for the community. I think that helps to uh, guide a lot of the decisions. So uh, for instance, um, Sean and Sarah has, uh, has a movie that's been around for a while. And, but they, a lot of the, their festivals are like horror oriented or very thematic and so folks will submit their movies towards that and that's what you become known for and some people do short movies and some people do Asian American filmmakers and whatever so it's a little bit like the logistics uh we could we could say ABC this is what you're going to do but really what makes a film festival or any event because I've run a lot of events is really the spirit in which you're doing it and so for us, we were all in it together to create something for the community um, at a time when the community really needed it. And so that was our guiding principle. Is there any other questions? Because we do have to move along. There's one, there's one thing I just want to, I want to make sure that, that uh, I would love to, I think that Orca, we are also, um, uh, I, what am I driving at? Uh, I would love to have a, a open dialogue and and hear of ways that we can um, help yep. the festival. You know, how could we? Are there ways we could? Is sort of piggybacking off of what Pat said. Is are there ways that we could be uh, uh, help help more? You know, um, and so I think I would love to keep that mm -hmm. channel of, that channel open. Um, because now we don't have Christopher who is here and and plugged in. I would I, I think it's a really valuable um, uh, program to have running through Orca since uh, is similar to how they do it uh, uh, in White River. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're I'm going to talk about it tonight. We're working on the thing with Montpelier Live to really focus on businesses in short segments. And I was just thinking that format would work great for you with all the things you've got going and we could spread it over um, a month or two, start in January and get the excitement going. But anyway. I love it. Yeah, our, our partnership with Orca this past year has been like super helpful to know that there's production, that there's equipment and there's space and there's just general enthusiasm has been really great. And that's definitely something that we would love to continue to encourage. And we are meeting with Montpelier Alive um, right after Labor Day. So um, I think the three organizations, the Green Mountain Film Festival, Montpelier Alive and Orca Media are really, uh, I think we're kind of on the same page with really wanting to make this a, a thing and uh, successful. You got our vote, thank you. Very much. Thank you. We'll, we'll I put a couple yeah. in the chat window that are. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, I yep. Oh, go ahead. Um, okay. I put a couple. I, uh, I'm getting that there's some uh, comments in the chat. I'll just go real quick. Um, the Capitol Theater in Savoy, we paid them. It was really, really important for us to make sure that the business survived and that the money went to them and reach out film programs. Um, so we did the curation in-house. Sam can um, no, really curated the festival based on what their connections were, what their theme was and also in conjunction with the screening committee so the venues had no say in um in what we played um which was a huge amount of trust uh put upon us which was great um so uh thank you and um i please consider me as like the person that please contact me anytime if you have questions with the festival I'm happy to answer them Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for this presentation. It was really educational. Are you willing to be a resource, uh, particularly to small businesses on social media marketing? Um, I could. That's uh, outside the scope of this program, but uh, happy to chat. Yep. So, but one of the things that Vermont businesses need, because a lot of our populations that are entrepreneurial are older, is some of the experience and you know you did some experimenting you've captured some lessons learned and you may be able to help the vermont economy yeah because so 
One of the things that I also do, because I do a bunch, is I'm uh, I'm working with Central Vermont Economic Development Corp, uh, which is our regional economic development corp here in Washington and Orange Counties. And um, I'm doing, I'm writing a report for one of their programs. And one of the things that I have found, it's not a secret, it's going to be in the report, so I don't mind talking about it right now, is that folks really want marketing and they really want help with digital strategies, um, mm -hmm. especially for uh, businesses that are based in rural areas where they might not even have um, ability to get online, but you that digital strategy is really going to help um, bring uh, their business name to top of mind. So I get you. That was a lot of what I did with VT Digger was run their digital strategy. Um, and that's how I was able to help them grow from a quarter million dollar organization to $1.3 million organization. So how to help. Yeah. Well, the Orca board won't be surprised because I came in through uh, EC Fiber, some board work I did with two founding board members. And um, so I've been kind of, we've been trying to find out whether Orca Media can support local business. I think I think there's a lot of opportunity. Well, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay, next on the agenda is uh, the strategic planning update from the circles. And who wants to go first? Person sitting next to me on the way. Okay. So we're, we've almost gotten to go to facilities. So I um, plan to go visit Burlington. Um, we're just lining up on the, should line up on the schedule. Oh, looking at going in a few weeks to one of our places, um, the Burlington one. Um, what else? Yeah. Well, we had kind of Good. we had a meeting, and um, actually the committee is right here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we talked about there was space opening up uh, next to us. The the room next to us opened up, and I called um, the woman in charge of the rental space, and because I was thinking in my head, this is leading somewhere, so I'm going to need your input that maybe having this whole section that can be opened and closed with the doors that kind of keep it separate from the rest of the building that we could make this into a Orca Haven. Um, but it turned out, of course, that the price was just a little out of our reach. And we started talking about um, having mobile um, studios, correct? Yeah, uh, mobile so that was, that was sort of the... Uh... One other circles that was coming up. Oh, was it? Had oh, I idea. skipped a circle. Wait a minute. And yeah, well, they you want them. I want to talk about that. So yeah. I think. And I was going to say, I think the reason Pat remembers is I joined the facilities conversation after the initial one, where I reported back from outreach. The outreach circle had started talking about going out into the community oh. and how just and figuring out ways to get the resources out to these these service areas that aren't in Montpelier that are that would be too far for them to drive an hour here to get equipment and if they had ideas about you know studio shows like it maybe wouldn't necessarily work out for them to come all the way here so then we started to think about how do we get our resources out to the community and looking at organizations that we, we might be able to tap into at like in Rochester or in Bethel and yeah. so that's where we said, you know, we were thinking if we're making a move toward having mobile pop-up studio and resource areas at the different er within the service areas that are further away from Montpelier, that spending that money here may not be the best use of resources or money just because to make this area better or like more robust and not have the money for the other areas to go out there. So we weren't sure if that's necessarily if we would have enough money to be able to do both. I think the pop-up thing, I think it's a great idea also. I also think it's an opportunity to, write, to search for grants, write grants for that. That sounds like a grant right. thing. Right, like the date. Where, where would we look for, I don't want to get too off topic, but where would we look for money for this, for what we do? Um, you know, you look in different categories so to right. find grants. What, what do you look for in your, in your shop? 
parts of the school? Um, well, I, I write my own grants, and it's to me like, to the federal government. It's yeah. to the Department of Education here, the Vermont the Department yeah. of Education here in Vermont at the national stage, and and also there's a lot of there are many people, there are many um, nonprofits and organizations that have money to give out. Do they have a right drink? That's a okay with this. So I think, but I think the pop up thing. I'm sorry. Oh, I, just, that's a good idea. I think it's a great idea, and I think I think that that looks like a grant. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, so and I think it was also in terms of like if we're looking at how we're spending our resources, like people power as well. And so it was like the or the outreach group was more about going out to the communities rather than having the communities come right. to us. And I think that was just like the the notion that I was bringing back from the outreach was that that was okay. kind of what we were thinking. Yeah, because yeah, we were talking about it because they finally moved the dances. Trying to do trying trying to do a video in this room while the dancers are doing their thing in the next room is a little difficult sometimes. I, the problem was when they would come out to the hallway yeah, right, right. was when the food had canceled. They're all kids. The kids, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so, um, what else can we talk about? I think, I, I think that would be a great visibility issue to be visible around the, around our, our area it would be great. Yeah. In fact, the other, <laughs> another does anybody thing. else have a comment about what we're just talking about? Only that that's what audited financial be helpful is because a lot of grants and foundations like seeing them and as we diverse resources right. um, which we have to do it'll be great yeah that, may I, I i never know quite where to look but i guess if you're thinking of education that's where we should start all right um, could i say something about yes Dave. one of the one of the things that's been analyzed in the whole post-flood time has been the number of people that have been unable to come to a central place like a city for uh, shopping, uh, for social action, uh, for interactions and for culture. And it would seem to me that there might be one way that we could describe the number of places where roads were out, culverts were destroyed, people couldn't come even to a meeting that was important at the state house. And so we're looking to try to take the culture to where people are. Yep. you know, pass the broken culverts, pass the roads that are out and have them be able to he hear and see things that they would normally have been able to get to easily 20 years ago or 10 years ago or two years ago. So it seems to me like it's another argument for when we appeal for money to yep. say that it's, it's not so we can get rich. It's so that we can have people be able to come over their roads and culverts and, and dams and floods yep. to the place where it's a so cultural center for a whole part of central Vermont. I get a big kick out of my mother, my mother's friend, she's since passed away, but in their 90s, talking about being on a Zoom meeting. And I did, it kills me because they feel very comfortable with it now. So we could bring it to them <laughs> by Zoom. So, so uh, we had other circles. Oh, you, you so continue? I was going to say, I think I did the outreach one about that's yeah. one of the things that we talked about and identifying community hubs within the various service areas. Um, the I was also part of the policy circle, and we um, we went through. We started to c gather the policies that we have in place. We had like the employee handbook. We had to see what we have currently as part of Orca's documentation, and so I started to collect that in a table of contents and have. And I think the next step for the policy group is to start looking at which policies are outdated, which ones need to be revised. Do we need are there gaps in the policies currently that we need to put into? So we started to collect up the documents and then we're looking at, you know, spending some time um, going through them. The other thing that we spent time was the mission statement, because we said as part of the strategic plan, I think there was some back and forth about revising the mission statement. And for the strategic planning process, we just kind of left it as is so we can go through the process of coming up with goals and things. But the policy circle also kind of wanted to bring that back and say, we would like to discuss it. We'd like to come to a conclusion and maybe get one down. And whether that's, you know, we were hoping to hopefully do it earlier. I know that we are, we're definitely trying to end at eight. So, and we're not really far into it, but that was one of the things that we wanted to try to put back in front of the board 
is these these are the various mission statements we were looking at. This is, you know, do we want to go with this one? Do we want to go with that one? Is there discussion back and forth that needs to happen? So that was one of the things that we did want to bring back to the board from our circles. Maybe if people want to do that, we could uh, set up for the next meeting to do it up front. Uh, because I remember we had a discussion on the mission statement when I first joined, and there were some great points made, and I think it deserves a little a little rehash. Oh. Sort of. Yeah, sort of. uh, you know, things change and th that stuff has to change too. So um, that's good. And also if we're if we're gonna be uh, charging money for certain things and hiring other people, we really need to have those policies, HR policies mm -hmm. in place. Very important. Um, so any anybody else reporting on circles? Who is what? There's two others, right? So that was, That's I reported out on, on the it. outreach and policy, okay. yes. So I think we're good. So I think, um, and so we're we're gonna also plan to try to meet up with everyone in our circles for the month of September, because that'll be a circles month Excellent. too. All right, great, Thanks. we'll meet on that. Um, on the, um, I had a disappointing uh, adventure. We wanted to look at the facilities here and to see how we could utilize what we have here better. And there's an organization in uh, Vermont called SCORE. And um, it's it's made up of retired retired professionals who volunteer their time in finance or a, I don't know, policy, whatever, that they would come to your organization and help. And I asked several times um, for somebody who might be a uh, somebody expert in, in business and office efficiency, what we could do with this uh, facility to make it more efficient, more attractive. But I never heard back from them. So I, I'm going to hear back from the email I sent today, I'm sure. Because <laughs> they're supposed to get back. But if they, will, if they can help us, that would be really great to have uh, free advice from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Any more comments on the circles? I have a question. Did the outreach group meet already? We did, Jessica. We in, it was in July, so it was that yeah. meeting that we had back in July, like the twelfth or something. Yeah. And then I think there was talk during that circle whether we might meet because I think we didn't capture CJ. CJ was not available, but that didn't happen. So it was just oh, that, okay. that we had. Yeah, but there, okay, but I was confused. September, we'll make it a make it a circle month. September. September, you said? September oh, is yes, September. Yeah, September. September. Yeah, so it's okay. every other. September is good. Yeah, because I think the circles are, are good because it's a smaller group and it's easier to sit and just gab. Yeah. Right. April and July are tend to be horrible months for me. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so, oh. both of those. All right, so next on the agenda, moving along, is the approval of the minutes. The minutes of June 25th should be, Mr. Chief, I mean, up. it should be, you don't have to approve these, is that correct? No, no there's nothing, unless they bring something to, to yeah. us. Um, the minutes are June 25th. Um, if anybody wants to move the minutes so we can discuss. Oh, look at you, <laughs> CJ. Where are you? Down the street. Where are you going? Um, this is the farm. Oh, cool. So the, um, got look, back from. So one of the things I see like typos, right? Um, so yes, yeah, so I don't take us off topic, but uh, that tall building with lights up there has a couple of horses whose combined age is over 60. Oh, my kind of horses. Wow. Cool. Fossils. <laughs> Oops, we lost you. Would anybody want to approve the minutes so that we can Discuss and uh, well, I did some. I'm, I'm just correcting some typos, names, and stuff like that. I did that already. Oh, okay. okay, so I will. Your first section, I got I, I, Was this me? <laughs> you wouldn't have misspelled your own name. I, I, I wouldn't have. <laughs> I would have. For the record, I'll approve the minutes for June 25th. Um, do I have a second? I second. Uh, Carlos seconds. Any discussion? Anything anybody wants to change or note? Silence. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I did want to note that I did add the 
the staff proposal that was noted in the, I think in the minutes that I think Chad was saying that we should probably include it as part of the minutes so that for the transparency piece. And so I did add it to the very end, the email that was sent out. So that's okay in case things, if anyone was like, what is that? So um, this point of order, um, Pat, did you move to accept the minutes? I did and Carlos second. Right. So yeah, as chair, you lose the pri privilege of making motions. You can sort of bid the floor. But if you want to make Carlos the, the mover and I'll be the second, that would be um, That's that would be our Roberts. Yep. Yeah, you, you're the neutral arbiter now. Oh, my God. So I, yeah, I, 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 I motion. And, and I'll second. Oh, thank you, Michael. I, yeah, I've been doing this for sure. years. I, nobody ever caught me on that. Oh, sorry about that. Oh yeah, no meeting one. I'll, I'll just. I hope that was kindly done, and you're doing fabulous. But just, yeah, as chair, you can vote on a tie, and um, you can entertain motions, but you can't actually make it. Like the vice president in charge of the Senate. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, we've had a first and a second, and some comments. And all in favor of accepting? Aye. Aye. Okay, aye. aye. All opposed? All moved. I have okay. a chance for you that I'm really sorry. Oh, we can't see you. I so yeah, I'll be your abstention. We should, have, we should have a meeting at CJ's. The yeah. Um, the financial report, that's such a pretty picture of you. Look at you. It's very nice. Uh oh we'll just be close to that kind of um, all right, financial reports. That's the UNCJ, CJ sent a, uh, an email tonight to uh, our emails if uh, you've got your cell phone or, or um, computer handy. No. Pat, I only sent to you and she can copy to Michael Labadi because I didn't have everybody's email. So um, figuring you guys could include it or forward on. Okay. But well, in the interest of Efficiency. If somebody can very quickly forward it to the rest of the board, you can skim it, and it'll probably save. Okay, go ahead. And if not, I can. Um, so, in short, um, uh, so let's see. So, Jen, you wanted me to go first? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. So, um, bear with me because I. There it is. I can share it also with the help. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I started out with just kind of a quick, by the way, that just on my screen. All right, how do you read? How do you hear? Perfect. Yeah, it's good. Sorry. Right here. We're good. Okay, you can hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yep. So um, if you want, I can, so I put, I, I opened with just a quick summary. Uh, we seem to be in an increasingly solid financial position, followed by a little bit of a caution um, that a number of factors have, you know, created some possible instability and pretty rapid inflation. So uh, well, I recommend and I intend to maintain pretty conservative and follow Mike Doyle's excellent lead. Um, I do think the board made a wide decision in agreeing that we should uh, do improved agility, so or increased agility in our in our ability to choose funds uh, with more flexibility. Um, I'm going to jump forward 
to the end of my report real briefly, just to explain that I spoke today with Stephanie at uh, Edward Jones office and last board meeting, you know, we had agreed the transition to, uh, to the new chair and the treasurer being the signatories. Um, Stephanie, the office manager went on vacation and just completely had forgotten about it. So she's going to have those documents out tomorrow. Those will do two, two things. They will make it so that instead of being restricted to American funds group, which have been eh, performance with respect to other opportunities that we could have been in, um, that will now change to a different type of uh, managed account, which takes a small percentage annually, but gives us the opportunity to switch at will between all of the available funds. And the second thing it's gonna do is it's gonna alter the signatures, which currently are Mike Doyle, Mike Abadi and myself, and it will become the, you know, me as the treasurer and the new chair will become the new signatory. <laughs> so that's kind of the important housekeeping stuff. As far as our overall position, um, our current uh, uh, war chest, if you will, or maybe a better way to put it is our current uh, assets, you know, and, and sort of fallback or things that could potentially be used above and beyond a certain number of quarters of operating revenue for projects is currently standing at a little under half a million. So yay <laughs> for Mike Doyle and his excellent stewardship. And, um, uh, but, you know, again, keep in mind that original caution that this is a very odd time financially. So uh, given you the asset breakdown of where the money is and in which funds, I'm not gonna read that to you. Um, the new account structure documents should be there for Pat and I to sign shortly. And that will both change the signatories and uh, change our flexibility. Any questions before I move on to audit? Speaking of Mike Doyle, since Bill Doyle just died, yeah. uh, does, should Orca do anything just to remember the whole Doyle family or whatever Bill Doyle's uh, uh, witness has been in the community and support for the things like we're, we've been doing? Well, I'm, I've been always very good friends with Bill for a hundred years and he's just spent a lot of time here in the world of his shows for years. And yeah. I, if mm -hmm. we could think of something, Dave, I'd be thrilled to be part of that. It could be we invent something like the Bill Doyle Award or something like that for yeah. a long time service in the community, in the legislature and then on creative uh, endeavors or something. My family is, I'm having lunch next, this coming, not this Monday, next Monday, with his daughter-in-law, but his son Lee died, Oreen has died, and uh, now Bill has passed. Uh, so he only has one daughter and one daughter left, I think. Well, and his brother Mike and his sister-in-law, who continues on the Doyle. Yes, uh, right, right. That, I think that your idea is wonderful. I think, David, that Bill would probably really like that. And so I'm in full support. I love the award. I think that Orca could film the giving of it and solicit recommendations from the community. Oh, that'd if, be what you have in mind. Yeah, um, that's exactly. I, I, and in order to do it in a way that's consonant with the D Doyle family, it could be we could invite Mike, Michael, to come to yep. a subsequent meeting to be the presenter the idea with him nice. well i'd be glad to reach out to his daughter-in-law uh, okay and uh, i'll ask her uh, i'll call her instead of waiting for the for my lunch and ask if, if other people are doing similar things to probably know because we want to do something special given yeah. his years of being here i have the bill doyle memorial tree that I use on my set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he has a fake tree that he used all those years, so I yeah. always <laughs> recognize it as the Bill Doyle Memorial Tree. I Maybe we, we could give a memorial tree away to the best. <laughs> <of you. laughs> <laughs> but then, but then, but I think Dave, that is just, I'm, I'm thrilled. So yeah, okay. People can think about any ideas and Give them to Zach or, or Jin. We will um, we'll talk about it. And I think this is something we should do sooner rather than later. So we'll do it by email and make a decision if that's okay by email rather than meeting. And we okay, can... that's good. Yeah. But do you want Jin to create the uh, the award? Because I'd be happy to bring her. Yeah. 
because mm -hmm. um, we've got a lot of um, community producers here. Maybe maybe we do our own award about. Yeah. Um, I would take myself out of it. That the best uh, the best group here. Yeah. Should I stop sharing? Yep. Do you want a motion? Uh, oh. If so, I'll make one. Yeah, please. Oh, you, yeah, that's good. Go ahead, CJ. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Go ahead, make a motion. Okay, so I move to create the uh, Bill Doyle Memorial Award for Community. Did you say leadership or? Yeah, uh, some, yeah, com community leadership and involvement or something <laughs> like that. That, yep. Okay, so I move to um, pursuant to David Connor's excellent suggestion to create the Bill Doyle Community Award for uh, involvement and service. That's great. Can you second? I'll second it. <laughs> second it. That's great. Um, any comments? Carlos is still. Is I'm definitely right. I'm not a typewriter. Right. <laughs> uh, the only question is, do we want to pr present something nice? In which case, do you want to fund it? I mean, we did have five percent returns on the windfall that we got from COVID, so there's a little bit. You know, you could take that money, which yeah. was. Good. If, if I could, maybe why don't we get all the people's ideas about what and how to do it, and then we can see, because if it's only a plaque, that wouldn't be so much money, but if we're going to do something beyond that. The John Block. Plaque. Yeah, like we've got a John Block plaque here. I saw that the other day, naming mm -hmm. this this room the John Block. I can't, John Block sorry, Block. that's hard to say. John Block. Block. Thank you. Um, but I could also call... Uh, and ask him because he probably would have some ideas. I, I think he would have ideas. And do you want to call him, Dave? I mean, I know Mike, but you could. Do you want? To oh no, him? I think you, I think you should call him. Okay, I'd be glad to. All right, so let's. I, CJ, if you don't mind, we're going to prove um, CJ's motion, but let's just hold up on the money till we figure out what we're doing and what we would need. So, um, all in favor of CJ's motion and Dave's second, say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. All right, so moved. Hey, CJ, you want to talk about, thank you, Dave, I'm, I'm beyond thrilled. Um, Sounds like a um, And David, thank you, because I just want to say, I'm so glad you brought that up and that you said that. Mike Doyle served this organization from its inception. And uh, I love, I just, I'm so glad you said that. Sure. So audit uh when i first became your treasurer a little over a year ago sorry about the background noise that's a cat staring apart a bag saying my dish is empty so i'll help myself um i had requested the board approve an audit and a budget for the audit which you all did um or your predecessors did and i requested it because you know, the last audit was 19 years ago and the last financial review 2016 nine years ago and I'm a new treasurer. There were some other substantial governance changes. You know, we went from an executive director to three co-directors, and we had a change of the chairman, lots of stuff. But mainly, um, in light of the changing picture of finance, which has traditionally been 5% of cable revenues for just the entertainment portion in our area, and the cord cutters starting to finally noticeably really create a downward dent in that revenue, as we discussed earlier, we're going to be starting to look at diverse funding sources. Um, now, we've had a bit of a windfall, ironically, with floods and COVID in that the legislature recognized our value to the community and has included us, not on a one time, but as I understand it, and please, Jen and, and uh, Zach and Pat, correct me and, and Mike, it's it looks like it's going to be annually in the budget and then Van will be distributing. Yes. Yeah. So. Yep. So that stabilized our revenue picture in a nice way, but we are still obviously looking at grants at possibly increasing need for Orca services to support, you know, small business in the community if uh, if that does in fact prove to be perfectly okay. And uh, there was um, somebody was going to be checking with, you know, the legal beagles to make sure we could do that. Yeah, we did. Uh, and we're good to do it? We have a list of what we can and what we cannot do. And, um, say, and that list is getting distributed or presented. Uh, I did last week, but I think what we should do, I can see it in a minute. I'm going to write it up and get it so it's in a minute and documented for what's the buzzword? Transparency. Transparency. <laughs> okay. 
in any case, um, uh, foundations and grant providers generally prefer and sometimes require audited financials. And I looked it up and it's generally viewed as a commitment to transparency. So do we need one? I don't see any signs of it at all. I'm really, you know, Mike did a great job. We're kind of a nice organization, but may it help us with our mission? Yes, it, it looks like it might. So um, I had gotten recommendations from past executive director, Rob, and somebody named Paul Haskell, who had been on the board of um, a local 501c3 transportation authority that ran into some stuff. Uh, Pat volunteered to put together a letter. Pat, I am still so grateful and said, you know, because Pat was like, why don't we do a competitive bid solicitation? And so we delayed moving on this. Uh, Pat sent out this great letter and Pat, nobody answered, right? Well, actually, I, I, one person did answer and it was Fred um, Duplessis, who is with Sullivan Powers. And I know Fred really well. But he, he said he couldn't do it now because he was busy, but at least he got back to us. So, yep. so yeah. He helped us find um, uh, somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. He gave me two names of people that specialize in nonprofits. Yeah, yep, yeah. So the good news is we have one firm. We'll be meeting uh, next week. Their first question is, Pat knows is, why are you trying to do an audit instead of a financial review? And so I wrote back and I was like, and I said to them what I had just said to you. So in short, by the next meeting, we should have a status update and uh, on you know what the costs are likely to be. I'm expecting it to be on the low end of costs simply because our structure is simple. We're not a huge C3. Um, we don't have super diverse revenue sources and uh, it'll be nice to have a baseline. Any questions or comments or Pat, do you want to add anything? In the sense, um, her name is Amity, which is a wild name. Kind of. <laughs> How is that word? The Gosard or Amity? Yeah. No, that was Amityville, but Amity. Anyway, Amity Orgiality. She's from McSoil. I can't say it. McSoley McCoy, which is a very well known firm in this area and um, in, in Burlington. And she um, she's going to meet with us. And I was very, very glad that and she seems very interested. Jin sent her our financials, so she'll be well prepared for our meeting. And it should go however quickly she can do this. We'd like to have it done by year end, I'm assuming. So yeah. thanks, EJ. Yep. And I think, I think no. Amity is a, in Latin, Amity is a, a word for a, a friendly relationship. Yeah. Cordiality. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard anyone having that name as Amity. It's like the Amityville Horror. <laughs> Isn't that terrible that that movie turned Amity into a bad word? Um, the only other question I have for the board is, um, you know, time permitting, uh, it can be educational to find out about compilations versus financial reviews versus audits and the different types of audits that uh, that can be done everything from the most basic, you know, yes, you're following generally accepted accounting principles and we've verified this to a forensic audit where something bad's happened and they're trying to figure out like, you know, embezzlement. So uh, if, you know, if people are super interested, it can be, you know, educational to know about that stuff just because life is not always rosy. Usually it is, but if you have something, could you send it to me? Because I told Amity this is a little above my pay grade. Um, yeah. kind of to know before we go to the meeting. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll send you a link to, uh, to sort of a nonprofit description of various types of financial right. looks. Of, and again, you know, this is not, not uh something where we're like oh you know we have a big need for it as rob chapman wrote you know we haven't really done a lot of it just because we haven't really had a call for it but, but it's a uh, to have to do yeah. just so you protect everybody you protect you and you protect the people that are working here and it's just yeah but it, and i mean it's a substantial amount of money given that our operations are pretty stable from year to year so i thought hard about do we really you know, want to do this given that we, you know, we're pretty simple, but I think in light of the fact that we need to diversify funding sources pretty predictably, um, it's good housekeeping and we may find 
very happy to have it done and behind us versus we need it and we don't have it. Oh, excuse so, me. I was like, we did lose uh, Michael and Jessica had to leave. And I know that Carlos was oh, aiming right, so for the eight o'clock close. We have the financial reports. We have the co-directors reports. Uh, is there anything before everybody leaves us um, that you that people must know and get in the record? Yes. Thanks, so um, I think part of the um, co-directors report, I did put in like the Telview purchase. So we are our broadcast server we had talked about in previous meetings where it's at the end of life so it's no longer being supported and they so I did the the quote for the new one and as of December I mean they won't for them to service the current broadcast server we would have to pay two years worth of ma the maintenance contract about fourteen thousand dollars because wow. each year is about six to seven thousand yeah. that we budget for so because of that we're beyond the end of life that they're like okay so this is the year either you buy at the end of december either you buy the new server or you need to commit to two years worth of maintenance so that we can keep you on this old machine that we've kind of said it's done. So that's what this, so this is for the new server and it's, the amount is about 30,000. So it's about like half what we would have to dish out in December. So it may, and we would still need to purchase the new one. So it probably makes more sense to go ahead and purchase the new one and we would get, so we wouldn't have, to, and I was, and what I wrote in our code director is like, we wouldn't pay for the maintenance contract because that's due in December. And then we get a free year's worth of service oh. with the new machine. So then we are kind of saving, we have 7,000 this year that we budgeted for it that we could use toward the purchase of the new server. And then next year's 7,000 that we would normally budget for, right. we would just kind of mm -hmm. save by saying that we already kind of spent it. So we, on the new server. So it makes sense that we should do it. And I did spend a, a, a fair amount of time with this, the sales rep to make sure yeah, that sure. what we were buying was the best one. Like we weren't buying something that, cause you know, with, with cable being like, if everyone's not gonna watch cable, like do we need a broadcast server? And do we need a very robust broadcast server? Can we get around like just having like the smaller version. So we did try to go through and we I pulled off a lot of the extras that we said, if we want to do something with this particular piece, then we can add that on later and we can actually budget for it. So the 30,000 is like primarily the base, what we need just to do what we're doing currently. So it was like half the price. Like so it's $14,000 basically. So yeah, well, $14,000 yeah. more. Well, right, so yes, yeah, because we have the two years. So right. I mean, it's still like this year we would be spending the thirty thousand that they quoted us, or and so it is a considerable amount, and it does need to, I think. But, yeah, that's still half the price of one of them. Well, I think well, even so we would like to expand. I think we should be sure that we set the. So yes, we are at a place where we have we have space to expand. So if we wanted to do, I think one, and it also with the new equipment, what we aren't able to do. So if at some point we want to stream our channel to YouTube 24 hours, like we don't have that software and that capacity now with our current server, but with the new server, we would be able to. So if we have to vote on this, which we do. Yes. We have Dave and CJ. It's two, three, four, five. How many people have to be in the new vote? It has to be a four. So it's going to be five. Uh, just then when does our current maintenance contract end for this year december so gotcha. that's why that's why we would have saved we would not spend the seven thousand we have in the budget because we would just buy the new right. server so we wouldn't use this maintenance contract so that's waiting we would pay it out in december but we wouldn't if we got the new one and then you got a year free yeah okay so are you just out of curiosity so it's seven thousand a year normally but for next year they would want fourteen thousand because they'd want us to pay in advance for the the two years thirty thousand for the new server first year free mm -hmm. included i should say 
Um, is the idea to complete that purchase at the close of support of this year's maintenance contract so that it would, the expense would incur in December? So yes, I'm expecting that we would do, we would purchase the server in December so that we would, um, we would, and I think it's close enough that the salesperson said that's fine. We won't you we won't charge you for the maintenance. And so if we can match it, and then it's close enough so that new year would take us to the new budget year, so that we wouldn't put that in the budget. Um, that in sorry, twenty twenty five. So that I think if we buy it in December, we can coordinate that so that we wouldn't have to pay the next the maintenance until twenty twenty six, and we could budget, and then we would throw that back into the budget at seven thousand. Right. And they may want to have you take delivery of the new server just to keep you from reevaluating before December. Well, now, I think the they've been, we've been back and forth many times over it. So I think it is like, you know, they're willing to work with us and they've been very helpful so that they're like, okay, you know, with the December, we can kind of stretch that. So I think it makes sense to go ahead and do that. And they also said, you know, like if we had something in, in December and we, needed maintenance they wouldn't just leave us hanging it like if we didn't have our server that time so i think they've been really like saying you know we understand that you have budgetary things happening so when you can do it so they would also prefer it to be december too but if something happened that we were in december and something went down and the new server wasn't here they would still cover us and even though the maintenance agreement hasn't been signed so what's the life expectancy of a new server I think so. 10 years. Yeah. I think that's a good, strong argument uh, in favor of paying for it. Yep. Yeah. It's really shocking. Yep. Is that a little for a lot? So, and that was one of those where I try to see, like, can we add to it? And they're like, you can't add to it. So it's not even one of those where you can swap out. Mm -hmm. So they're like, you need to commit to that amount. And so that's where I was like, okay, so that's where one spot where I was like, okay, let's pay a little bit more just so that like right now we have a very small and I'm constantly swapping out. What, and what is your current storage? Uh, like, ten, I think 10 terabytes? I think 10 well, that's, you mean available? How, how much, like, yeah, is this going to cover what you need? Yes. So the, the 20 that we went through, I went through all the different ones. Because right now we manage through it. It gives me a little bit of space. And so it's like, and if something should happen that we need more. So that's where it was like back and forth of how much space. And I think the 20 upgrading to it would be enough. And especially since it's one of those where it's like, right now, what our our process is is that we keep everything on our backup server so that's where that's the one that we continuously add to and that gets bigger and bigger and that mm -hmm. holds it so this is just primarily for like choosing between what we're going to broadcast on the channel so in that sense it doesn't need to be super expandable mm -hmm. it's nice to have that space just so that it gives a little bit more freedom but in terms of where we hold all our content that's the backup server and that is expandable sorry okay sorry sorry um would anybody like to make a motion um to accept jim's proposal to buy the new server this is something server. just out of curiosity is it, do we feel it a comfortable quickly voting on this right now or should we um like, can we wait and talk about this next time wait. it is a pretty big expense we can wait um, for sure just, I, 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 I don't want to rush this so it's can one of wait? those it, we can because it's like it's okay. september so october we're having another board meeting so it is you know okay. to put it in front of you yeah, whether sure we and if there's to be here yes but I did want it to put it up because I think we'd been talking about end of life like a while. So it's like, now here's the quote to yeah. think about. Well, so, I agree. That's we'll, we'll put that in new business to discuss, right? Yeah. yeah. So and maybe we can push it toward near the top of the meeting. Yeah. I was going to say we can add it to the top as old business, like it'd be old business next meeting. Yeah, we also <laughs> Next meeting it would be old business because it's new business kind of to new this time. <laughs>
What happens to the old one? Okay. We're trading it in. So we're getting a credit for the old equipment. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so I think that's a good idea. What else do we put on top of next meeting? Yeah, so you were talking about. We told you about the program, so let's put that first on the meeting so we don't. PJ, how much credit are they giving? I'm sorry? How much credit are they giving? 3500 Yes. Is that what you asked, CJ? It is. Yeah. Back. Yep. Just wondering what happens if we put it on Facebook Marketplace or something or eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably not going to be a big market. Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. I'm curious, like in terms of depreciation and stuff like that, well, like what would we be able to depreciate? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is a new business. Um, talk about the. About how to finance it, kind of thing, in terms of like. Well, I'm just wondering. Yeah. Uh, if, I don't remember what in terms was. of the financial hit, mm -hmm. uh, I guess it is different because we're a nonprofit, but you know, whether we'd be able to depreciate the expense, the cost of the thing over yeah. what sort of term? It's a really good question. And the other question is given that we have a couple of months and we're a nonprofit and we've helped, do we want to go for a grant or a low interest room from Vita? I mean, if we're getting 5% on our CDs and Vita will loan us money at two and a half. Ah. Yeah, I, I think that's um, this is what this is why I'm like, no, no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> um, I'm permitting thing, but we are going to need to learn how to do grants and applications. And this is a really simple and obvious and compelling thing that we need for the community. So if there is time, and I don't know much about grant writing either, so I'd be willing to get in harness with somebody. Uh, as Pat has found out, I'm not always easy to be engine. I'm not always easy to be in harness with because I work in fits and spurts, but um, I think it's a skill we're going to need. So I, I've done a, quite a few grants in my. Just a thought. But I also think we need it. And so we yeah. don't need. Well, we have a person on the staff that we're talking about bringing in for like outreach and stuff. I think that this is like if we're looking for this person, they should. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't need someone full time grant writing, but if we bring yeah, in someone who just really is, if this is where we want to push, then have someone you know dedicate ninety percent of whatever time they give right. us to grants, right. as opposed to like you know hit beating the bushes uh, for funding uh, around town. Right. Yeah, I think what we're doing, especially if we're able to do some small business support, we may find that um, you know. Grant writing and application to foundations is a really great way to go and have a lot of fun. We'll need a bigger team, though. I hope you guys are ready to manage more people. Thank you for all that. Do you have anything on your thing? Because I was going to talk about Montpelier Live and our business. No, it's not I have uh, Josh and I went to see uh, Katie Trout, who's head of um, oh, did I see that thing? Oh, cool. Sean. Um, so we went to see Katie Trout, and I asked her because the businesses in Montpelier are just still struggling so much um, because of the three floods they've been in and the, all the other stuff. So I I put out a proposal to her that we would work together with her and highlight businesses at a, a 15 minute, maybe either 15 minute or a half hour um, that we'd be doing um, interviewing uh, business owners, talking about what their products and, and trying to get people to remember to shop locally, things that are happening at Christmas time and getting people downtown. And Katie was very excited about that. Um, I have a lot to do. I'm gonna put it under, Another entity I have floating around there is called um, Banter and Beans. And the logo is a coffee cup uh, with a lot of beans because the banter is gabbing over a cup of coffee was the, was the uh, slogan. And then, and then the, the byline is what's brewing in Montpelier, get it? <laughs> um, so so uh, I just, if Katie, if if Katie Trout's new Cajun band as a recording, you know, I, we could include that in our pack. 
about fundraising, you know, yeah. and uh, and tell her that uh, we'd like to promote that uh, music uh, through through our own fundraising uh, abilities here. Oh, anyway, I love Katie. I swear I don't know how she does. I know she's way younger than me, but I never had her energy ever. And she's very talented as far as innovative ideas, and she just doesn't stop. She is amazing. Oh, she might have to get the Bill Doyle Award. <laughs> oh, she, I give it to right away. Um, but, um, but anyway, what is, then what is, was, and if we did that with Montpelier, I was also going to move it over to Berlin because they're in, that's my town, and we don't do jack to um, talk about Berlin. And then I was going to talk to Tony Campos to get him to do it in Barry. So Central Vermont is doing what it can to support small businesses. So that's that's our latest thing. And Sean is very excited about helping. And then we would get pictures when we can of the businesses. I always find when you interview somebody in a business, it's you worry about the lighting and the noise and people walking by you when your video, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we just wanted to include um, pictures of the businesses and their stock and stuff. And we'll make it good. Really so that's what we're doing. So what, what John Block and I had talked about at one point in time was the idea that, you know, small businesses, their expertise is not, uh, you know, promo, mark on marketing and communications. And so Orca's expertise in creating video, if they showed up with a little video of their farm and some pictures, yeah. we could help them create a really simple uh, presence. Exactly. And that because that has always struck me with Orca Studio and expertise and how scary it is to do something like this when you don't know how yeah, yeah. Um, to really you know be oh. of to the community. But uh, I just I'm that the way in Orca I'm in an Orca board meeting, uh, oh. so I'll call you back. Um, right. But this is just kind of a a mention. So the. Ultimately, the way I met John and Rob is um, I got to Vermont. I won't talk about my background, but except to say that I was very tech heavy in telecoms and networking. And I got to a place where there was no networks. So, uh, and then I became aware of the fact that we had a drug problem and that the kids were committing suicide. And so I went to the state. They were committing suicide because they were getting addicted, not they couldn't get out or because their friends were getting addicted and killing themselves. So I, um, I heard that there was going to be a funding source for business broadband networks. And so I put together a list of small businesses in my area. And I'm mentioning this mainly because um, the state ended up writing an $800,000 grant to run fiber down Route 14 in Randolph, East Randolph, because I gave them a list of small businesses. Those businesses in general were not listed in the Chamber of Commerce because they were too small to ever get there. My post help me the local rails and trails guy to help me and so those are the ones that desperately need our help they're too small to make a chamber of commerce yeah that's interesting you go out yeah talk to the postmaster in your town and say could you go through and look for you know these types of records and sean clement the randolph postmaster can help with this huh. uh, help me then so it's just a thought i don't want to take up too much of the board's time but because Part of the reason we selected the board we have is to try to get geographic diversity, and this is credit to Mike Abadi for doing this. Um, we, you know, we can see whether we can replicate. You know, yep, replicate that. Pay our camera people or do it ourselves uh, if the, you know if they're willing or do it ourselves. They really and uh, and just doing that will provide some well-needed, uh, much-needed exposure to these tiny businesses. They're small. I mean, one of this was a kid raising hedgehogs for sale. That was one of the businesses I counted for the state to justify them making that investment. So there it is, my story about both grants and about how Orca can help. <laughs> well, yeah, great. And how tiny some of these businesses really are. I was using my radio show all last fall to encourage people because they don't realize that January to January, January to March is such a slow time for all businesses because the 
the holiday season is over and this holiday season was destroyed. And so they didn't have much money going into the first quarter of 2024. And I'm sure, I'm surprised they were all saying that we're gonna see more businesses closing. And um, so far we're hanging in there, but I don't know how. So anyway, do you, does anybody have anything under the uh, co-director report, Jim, and staff that the no, I think it was just usually to clarify if there's any questions about the code reference report that we presented or submitted. I'm right. I'm getting ready to go. <laughs> I'm right, ready folks. to go. Yeah. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, do, we, do we need to, need to motion the, the motion to the How many motions for the for the financial reports okay. for both, right? We have both yeah. or uh, separately? They're separate. You, can, you, can, you should do them separately. I think. Yeah. Yeah, so I motion for um, to accept the financial reports. I can second that. Okay. Our financial reports have been first and seconded. Um, there is no further comments. Could uh, all in favor say aye? Aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Okay, and the uh, Co-director reports. I will motion to uh, accept the co-director's report. Second. There you go. Okay. Co-director's reports have been first and seconded with no further comment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. So moved and we uh, with no objection will call the meeting. Close the meeting at 8.26. Let's see what the day of the next meeting is. Uh, let's see. I'm going to write that down this time. <laughs> so, September. October, and it's the fourth. One, two, three. The 22nd of October is the fourth Tuesday. Is that okay with yeah. everyone? We're not having a September meeting? September is circle, so you should be getting in, your circle people should be getting in contact to have a circles meeting. And if there's, um, I think, but not an official board meeting. Right. All right, so October 22nd uh, for next board meeting. Yes. 6.30, excellent. Thank you all very much. Do you have any comments how to improve the meeting? Let me know. Oh. Good job, Pat and Mike Abadi. Good job supporting Pat and thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Good to see you and hear you all. Take care. Thanks. Is that what you say when you're 80? <laughs> <laughs> see you. Okay.